Friend, we're back and I am excited. It is Sunday afternoon here on the river and that can only mean that it's Tuesdays with Tata. How you doing, Tata? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm good. I'm looking out there and it looks beautiful, but it doesn't feel very good, does it? It's hot. It is very hot. hot today. There's a wind from the south that feels like a sauna. That's right. Yes. Crazy. Very hot wind. Yep. Tata, this week I was out running on the driveway and I got charged by a badger. Uh, yes, I saw the picture. <laughs> that was funny. This place has so much wildlife. Uh, yeah. Not all of it friendly. That would have frightened me right there. Yeah. I'm going to have to start running with a handgun, I yeah. think. So. Yeah. <laughs> or, or the infantry. Yeah. yeah or bring Al Genitone with me, maybe. <laughs> yeah. It's all in August and we're down to the wire here. We're nearly at the end of the month. And we, uh, I hope you've joined us on this journey, but we've done a podcast every single day this month. And if you haven't started, then use September as your all-in month. You can go back and get all these resources that we've talked about, all the episodes and all the conversations and all the things we've talked about, and it'll be helpful to you. But Tata's got another lesson for us this week. Tata, well, who are we going to talk about? The, we're, I'm, I'm in First Kings uh, 19. We're talking about Elijah and Elisha. Uh, remember, we talked about Elijah one time before. Yes, we did. And we left him in, in First Kings 19. He was fleeing Jezebel. Yeah. Elijah was. He had an encounter with the prophets of Baal. That's right. And, and a, a, Ahab told Jezebel all about it, and Jezebel threatened to kill him. That's right. So he ran. It, all of this took place, and but what the main thing I want to talk about is Elisha himself about being all in. He was all in. He was all in to be the assistant or the helper for Elijah. Let's try the understudy. And, yeah. He's, but he was plowing when he got the call. And he was plowing with 12 oxen. Think about that. 12 oxen, and he was plowing with them? That's a big plow. I think it was several plows. But anyway, you think about the normal, probably a normal Jewish person, farmer at that time may have had one. Yeah. And if he was probably well off, he would have had two. Yeah. Because oxen had to be cared for. That's right. So this was the family business. He was running the family farm here. It's like Jerry Deaver and the guys had all their combines out there in the field. And this right. is what Elisha yeah. was doing. Yeah. But he had... But when he decided that he was going to go with Elijah, he burned the he burned all the plows and sacrificed the oxen. Yeah, he chopped up he the oxen and cooked them on the plow wood. <laughs> yeah, it was the ox yoke. That's right. He, so he made a decision that he was going to be yeah. all in. There was no going back. And That's and right. what it reminds me of is the story when you were you talked about burning the ships. That's right. Or the missionaries that packed all of their goods in coffins. That's right. They were never going back. That's right. And, and I don't know if that's, a, if that's a decision that we have to make, that if that's a posture we have to take, but we have to decide it's a choice that that's we right. have to decide what we're going to do. And, and Elisha, when he decided, he was very definite. That's right. Now, what kind of posture did that put him in? With his mom and dad, I don't, no. I don't know. I don't think they were very happy with Probably him. Probably not. That's a good point. And don't hear us say that you've got to go kill all your cattle and burn them up and give them <laughs> to God. That's not your calling for all in. What Elisha was doing was saying, my former life was I'm a plow hand and my new life is I'm a prophet and That's I'm right. not going back. And I'm not going back. I even be like me burning down my operating room and all my instruments. <laughs> like I'm not going back. Yeah. Plus I'd be in a lot of trouble with Ivan, the CEO yeah, of yeah. the hospital. Yeah, that's but true. It's all that's in. True. That's true. But, and so what we do when, you, when we decide to go all in, we decide that, that this is what we're going to do. That's right. And, and it's not, it, and what Elisha is saying is there was no going back for him. That's right. He was not going back on on what on the decision that he was going to, he, that he was all in and that he was going to be he was going to replace Elijah and, and if you look forward that Elisha he he was right with him and what what was interesting to me though is when Elijah put his uh, cape or his cloak on Elisha yeah he said what have I done to you so even if, if Elisha with, had, was faced not only with making that decision, he was he was faced with deciding: Is this the right guy for me? Yeah. So he was looking at he was looking at a very hard place. Mm. And I would I'm saying that probably Elijah and his humanity, 
was saying that because here he was terrified. He even told the Lord when he was in the cave in the desert that he was he was very jealous for God and that he was a prophet for God mm-hmm. and that he, but he was the last one that was left That's because right. all of God's people had destroyed the altars mm-hmm. and killed the prophets. That's- and I'm the only one left, he said. And so he was frightened mm-hmm. by that. Yeah. But anyway, he but he still was part of the call. He was part of the decision that Elisha had to make. That's right. Even though he, when he put his cloak on him, he said, what have I done to you? That's what are you getting me into. You think about uh, Isaiah, when he was, when he said, when the Lord said, who, who will go? Who shall we send? He yeah. Said, I'll go. He said, yeah, and here then, am I. When I read in verse 11, for how long will we yeah. yeah, so that story is great because God says to Isaiah, the prophet, who will go for me? And Elijah, I'm sorry, Isaiah quickly says, I will go. Send me here, my send me. And in just a couple of verses later, he's like, for how long, oh Lord? <laughs> and so Elisha answered that question for himself, didn't he? It's not how long, it's like forever. Like that's, I'm burning the plow. Right, that's right. He burned the plow. He burned He burned up all of the farm implements and he barbecued the oxen that's and right. gave it to the people. So the oxen were not wasted. That's but, right. But the, the, what the whole point of that is, that, and what we learn from that is that when we make that decision, that we don't go back on our word. That's right. We, and am I saying that was an easy decision for Elijah? I don't think so. And I don't really think that it was easy for him to decide and because he had his family. In fact, as he told Elijah, let me go back and kiss my mom and dad goodbye. That was final. Let me go back and kiss them goodbye. Because he's gone and not coming back. I think there's some real world examples we could think of like people are listening and they're like your your friend you're trying to say what does it look like what am i going all in for and about and what does it look like in my life like sometimes it might be you finally you humble yourself enough to say i'm sorry and i'm going to fix this relationship we're going to get into marriage counseling or i'm finally going to go and join alcoholics anonymous i need help here you're finally willing to make the change that you've not been previously willing to make and is it possible? Could Elisha have quit and gone back home? I'm sure he would have. He sure. could have. But the the gesture of burning the plows and sacrificing the auction was a big deal. This is an economic reality. I'm writing a check. I'm giving away all my it's livelihood. Not- and my new job is to be prophet and follow Elijah. Yeah. That's, a, that's the kind of definitive thing we're talking about here. And it's not sell your house and give away all your possessions like the rich song ruler was asked to do. But you'll know what it is. Mark Batterson makes that clear in the book. The call on your heart and on your life is usually pretty clear. When we know that thing that we haven't given God all of yet, it's pretty clear. And and the the question for us now then is, are we willing to do it? Are you willing to go all in? And sometimes the question (laughs) is finally, we have to say to God, I can't do this by myself. That's right. And that's a good point. It's not by yourself. That's right. It's just willing to submit to his leadership. That's right. And that's where... And that's where the, sometimes we have a hard time because how do we say that? How do we come to some kind of peace with ourselves that we finally say, I can't make it anymore. I can't do this by myself. I need help. And I'm sure it's just like reaching out for help and I'm as guilty as anybody. I don't hold my hand up and say, I need help. No. And I don't go, I don't go find the line that says, we will help you here. That's right. But at the same time, that, that one of the things that, that I've tried to do is I've tried to make peace with God, at, on, on, not on my terms, but on his terms. That's right. And he, all he wants from us is us to surrender. That's right. And all we have to do is claim Jesus Christ is our Lord That's right. and obey him. That's right. And, and even John t- tells us in, when, in the, in later in his life when he's writing that God's commandments are not grievous that we can follow them. And that's how we know that we love God. That's right. And that's how God knows we love him. That's right. If we follow his command. That's right. And so Elijah, in my opinion, is just making, he made a decision that he's not, he is going to, he's going to serve God because he knows what he's <laughs> getting into. He knows that Elijah is a prophet and he knows Elijah is not very popular. That's right. Not with the queen or with the king either. That's right. But he is popular with God. That's right. Because he's, 
And the prophet, and I heard someone say this one time, that prophets were only mouthpieces. They were a mouthpiece for God. They spoke yeah, for God. That's right. And, in time, and we know that in times past that, that God did speak using prophets. Yeah. But somewhere in here, when we were struggling, and we and friends, if we're, and I know it sounds, when we talk about it, it sounds very easy to do. But when we're struggling, when, and we're, <clears throat> but we have, when we've reached that point where we cannot go any further, that's when we have to get on our knees. That's right. And we have to submit ourselves to God's leading. That's right. And, and, and that's where, that's what's hard for some people to do. That's right. Sometimes it's paradoxical. Sometimes we got an email yesterday from a guy who said, hey, I'm 65. I don't know what to do. I don't know how to do it. I, I don't know how to get after it. Like, I, I, don't, I don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you're worn out, you're stressed out, you're beat up. You're, as I say in my new book, sad, sick, stressed, and stuck. Like you're just stuck yeah. and you don't know what to do. And sometimes what you haven't gone all in on is God's plan for how to balance your life. Sometimes so, it's, do we need to keep a Sabbath? And we say, I, how can I keep Sabbath when I don't have enough time to do all the things I need to do in seven days? Mm -hmm. When God's math, six days works out and seven days wears you out. Yeah. Like, that's how it works, right? <laughs> that, God exactly commands right. us, that's make right. time for me. Give me space. Give me your finances. Give me your marriage. Give me your children. And it'll work out in a way that you can't imagine it working out. So sometimes one of the ways to go all in then is to learn how to rest and balance, yeah. to learn to try to do less and make better decisions and use that holy no that we've talked about before and stop mm -hmm. thinking we have to please everybody. So what some of the things that you could choose to go all in on might be almost counterintuitive. It might be the negative. Like I thought I had to do more and the truth is I need to be yeah. less. Yeah. And that, that's part of the issue, the problem for us, because that's part of the issue, is that we think we have a hard time accepting God's grace. That's right. We say, okay, I get that, but I need to do something too. That's right. No, we don't. All we have to do is say yes. That's right. I know, and I know that does not sound right. I know that it, it sounds too hard, it too, sounds too, too good to be true. And I'm still, I, I still concern myself and I, I think about people that have made a decision that says none of this can be true. In the Bible. Yeah. But what if it is? But it, all we have to do is come to some kind of point of, of understanding that says, I, I cannot do this by myself. That's right. I have to admit that I can't do it. And that's what Elijah was saying. I, I'm not going to do this anymore. I'm not going to plow with these oxen anymore. Yep. And I'll show you Elijah. because yep. I'm going to, I'm going to get rid of them mm -hmm. and I'm going to get rid of the farming equipment. What else could he do? That's right. It's Abraham putting Isaac on the altar and picking up the knife. Like it's, right. it's full commitment. It's Peter getting out of the boat. That's it's right. Jonathan climbing the cliff as, as he says in all in. Oh yeah. Like it's the whole idea that you stick yourself out in the place where you say, God, this next step is impossible unless you take me there, unless you do it. That's right. Like, it's not possible. I can't go all in without you carrying me there. Like that, that's that, that step that you have to take. In the, in the grief world, there's a book called The Lament for a Son by Nicholas Wolterstorff, who lost a boy in the 80s. And it was one of the books that really helped me after we lost Mitch. We had this, this week where we had our 11th year without <laughs> Mitch and, I know. and the, and the service on Friday and all that stuff. Um, and I remember reading that book and he said, faith is like a footbridge and you don't know if it'll hold you up until you get out on it. That's like, right. Like you've got to walk out over that canyon onto the bridge before you know that your faith was placed well or not. And that's how this is. This all in life, that this time when it's time to go and get after it to answer William's email, you don't know that you can. Until you go, until you right. say, God, I'm giving it to you. I'm taking this step and God right. will hold you up. He'll, he'll right. be there. He'll meet you in that moment. That's right. <clears throat> and that's why it's so hard for people to do that because what it indicates is I surrender. That's right. I give up. It's almost like I hold my hands up and say, I just give up. I can't do this by myself. And when you do that, when you come to that point, it, it's scary. That's right. Because it's what it's what you're doing is you're you're letting go of everything that's familiar and you're letting go of the routine that you've established for yourself and when you do that that you have to have that replaced that's right and if you replace it with something that you don't know 
it's even harder. Now, the other part of that is God knows that. He knows how we look. How does he know that? He created us. That's right. He made us. That's right. He gave us free will. will to, and, and he gave us the will to do as we choose. Even, and the case in point is Adam and Eve. That's right. He told them, don't. And they did. Yeah. And we've been suffering with it ever since. <laughs> yes, we have. And that's we will correct. continue to suffer with it. That's correct. And that is, that, that, that's what's so hard. And let me tell you something. It's hard for me to accept that as well. It's hard for me to accept the fact that, and I thank him every day, that Jesus died for me. That's right. How did that happen? How could that, how could we, how can we accept that? Mm. That God loved us so much that he sent his one and only son, Jesus Christ, to die for us. John three sixteen. He hasn't asked anything of us that he wasn't willing to do himself. Ah. You talk about all in. Oh. Jesus gave it all yep. and, and laid himself down for us. And so we certainly can trust that he'll be there for us when we make that decision as well. I think this whole idea is, and it all comes down to spiritual stuff, like whatever you're dealing with, friend, if it's addiction, if it's suffering, if it's grief, if it's lack of high performance in your career that you need, if it's a marital relationship, whatever that issue is, ultimately you keep peeling those layers off and it comes down to how much do you trust God? to give him that situation. That's right. And say, okay, I'm going to get, we, we shared that email from a woman named Kathy a few days ago, dad, that, that I read on the podcast a few days ago and, and had this conversation about wondering if Jesus was just a guy, just a noble figure that we could learn things from. And my response to that is, is we, when we wonder what God's role is in our suffering or in our stuckness or in this, whatever it is that we're in, thinking about going all in, after, when we realize we what got us here won't get us there, when we wonder about that, ultimately it comes down to we usually have talked more about God, chatted with other people more about God, read books about God more than we've actually gone to his word and That's seen right. what he says of himself. That's right. And what the Holy Spirit says is this word, when we say the word, of course, we mean the Bible. So if you're not familiar when we say the word of God, we're talking about scripture, the Bible. And what he says in the Bible is that the word is living and active and sharper than a sword. And it'll get down in your joints and it'll sort you out and it'll help you get cut you open and show you the places that you need to give to it. And so the point of all that, Kathy and William and everybody else that's listening here is just this. Whatever the place in your life is where you're suffering, where you're stuck, where your hands on the plow and you recognize it ought not to be is it's a spiritual matter at the end of it. Like it comes down to, do you trust Jesus has the power and the intention to help you in this? Right. And are you willing to let him take it? And, and also a starting point it, for me has been very simple. Just be thankful. And you right. think about what we, what was the gifts that we have breath. That's right. And we don't have to think about it. That's right. We have the ability to see. We have the ability to hear. We can feel. We can taste. Mm -hmm. And we have all of these gifts, that, and we have all of the, and, and I know some people said it came from washing up on some beach somewhere, yeah. uh, some molecule. But Mike, I have a question about how did, where did that molecule come from? That's right. Where did the beach come from? Uh, yeah. Who made the beach? Yeah. So, and, and for, what I think you have to do is you have to sit down and say, okay, I, I get it. It's not me. I didn't do any of this. And yes, I'm suffering right now. Yes, I have struggles and I've lost loved ones and I'm sick and I, I can't see how I'm going to get past where I am right now. That's right. But, and, and, and I don't have the answers for all of those things, but I know this, that the, the peace that comes from trusting God can't be measured. That's right. It can't even be defined. Right. We don't have any understanding of it. Um, and it's part of the mystery, I think, that of being God's creation, uh, because we're in, we are part of his creation. He created us. And it's hard for us to understand that really the reason that Jesus came was so that he could learn how to be like us. That's right. So that we could be like him. That's right. That's right. Now, how do you figure that out? That's not, so what we have to do. So what I'm saying is that, is faith blind? 
yes, but we have to put our faith somewhere. That's right. That's right. We have to believe in something. That's right. And I know this, the, the faith that I have is not disappointing to me. That's right. I, I'm not worried about a nuts, what the definitions that people have today. I'm not concerned about all of the issues that, what if I don't wake up in the morning? What if I get, uh, and I remember when years ago I was in, w went to school at, for the, with the Aetna in Hartford. And one of the things that they told is only three things that happen, can happen to you in this life as a human being. You can either die too soon, you can be disabled and never be able to work again, or you can live too long. Yeah. So, those, so that's where you are. So what if? What if? We can't answer all of the ifs. I'm trying. We don't have an answer for that. But I know this, that when, when we're placing our trust in God and placing our church, trust in Jesus Christ as our Lord will give us the peace that we're looking for. That's right. And sometimes that requires that sort of bold mood. Uh, sometimes it requires that sort of all-in mood. Elijah made that decision. That was a bold decision that he made. That's right. He did make a bold decision. He made that all-in decision that has to be made when you come to that, the, of wondering if God will keep his word or not. Uh, wondering if God's will for you is good, his plan for you is good, like he says, if his promise is good. Uh, that's a bold decision because you're right. not sure. When I was doing interviews for Hope is the First Dose, and we were doing all the press around the release of that book, one of the common questions that I got asked, Tata, was, what's the difference between faith and hope? Mm. And my best working answer that I came up with is faith is the belief that God can do the things he says he can do. Hope is the belief that God will do those things for you. That's right. <laughs> that, he'll, that he'll do it, not just generically for other yeah. people, but for me. So yeah. if, you, if you believe that God can do the things he can do and you have that faith, but it, you come up short of saying, yeah, but does it really count if it's me? Am I willing to stick my neck out there yeah. like, and go after it and make that phone call and yeah. say, I'm sorry, or fully commit to my job or or take this new opportunity or whatever it is that you're feeling like you're coming up against the edge of, sometimes you just have to burn the plow. That's right. Sometimes you just have to go after it and go all in. That's right. Because the question is, do you want, do you, how, how much peace do you want? That's right. And how, how will it feel like to have peace? Uh, and I, how would it feel like to have hope? That's right. And so when we, when we, when we personalize those, those two, two questions, then we can make that decision. That's right. When we finally decide that I can't do that, I mean, I've said that several times, but you have to decide that there's some point where you come to a resolution that says, I can't do this by myself. That's right. I cannot do this. Or you don't even have to say that. You just have to say, I can't do this. That's right. Period. I think that's a good time to remind people. We're always talking about self-brain surgery. You don't do self-brain surgery yourself any more than... Jerry Deaver and the farmers out there make that alfalfa grow. No. So you, yes, when you're going to have surgery, there's a role that you play in that. You go to the doctor and you find out that you have a tumor or a hernia or whatever it is. And the doctor says, here's the plan. Here's what has to be done. The day that the surgery is supposed to happen, you've got to wake up and not eat anything after midnight. And you got to get in your car and drive down to the hospital and sign a consent form. Mm -hmm. And you got to let them put an IV in you. And then you have to let somebody else perform that operation. Mm -hmm. You have a role to play, but you're not doing the surgery. Mm -hmm. And you're not creating the anesthesia machine. And you're not performing all the pharmacy work that has to be done to make that happen. So when we say that you're submitting to surgery, it's not the same as you having to do all the work. And the same thing is true in self-brain surgery. We're not saying, and, and going all in, we're not saying that you have to to wear yourself out doing all this work. We're saying you have to consent. That's right. You have to yeah. lay down your will to the will of the Father. And In the self-brain surgery world, thinking, we're going to say, I didn't make this brain. Mm -hmm. I didn't make this mind. I didn't make the quantum field in which God communicates with me. But he gave me a mind and a way to interact with all that. And my job is to consent to his leadership and guidance, mm -hmm. and operate myself as best I can under his influence. That's right. And think about the... But you're just described. What happens to us when we go into the hospital, we lay on the bed, we trust the guy that's going to cut us. That's right. Or the person that's going to 
cut that's us right. or perform the surgery. That's right. We trust. That's right. And when Jerry and those guys drill that field and put those alfalfa seeds in the ground, they didn't make those seeds mm. and they didn't make that dirt and they didn't make the magic that happens inside it, but they're doing that work, stewarding God's creation, that's knowing right. that he's going to keep his promises and produce that crop that's and right. feed all of us next winter and feed all those cattle next winter and keep America's engine going and all of that. He's not having to do the work, but he has a role to play in it. Right. And so don't think we're ever saying that when it's time for you to go all in or it's time for you to do self-brain surgery, that you have to do more work. You, you're having to bear up under the suffering and do more work. The role is to get to the cusp and say, yes, I'm ready. I'm ready to let you lead me into That's this. Right. And what does God say? His divine power has given you everything you need That's right. for life and godliness. That's what does he say? I can do all things through him who gives me strength. That's right. Right? That's right. And, and, and you go back to what Jesus, the disciples came to Jesus and said, what work must we do? What did Jesus say? Believe. You must believe. That's right. That's the work. That's the work. That's the work. So, so, so that he empowers and he guides and he directs and he, the Bible says it plain. Paul says it. God works in us to will and to act in ways that please Him, His power, right. on His time frame. That's right. We just have to submit. That's right. And we all we have to do is say yes. That's right. So our hands to the plow, we're running the failing business. The old prophet comes and says, hey, I'm calling you out, yes. Dennis. <laughs> I'm calling you out, Kathy. I'm calling you out, William or Lola or whoever you are, wherever you are. It's time. Your call has been made. What got you here won't get you there. It's time to make a decision. And if we're going to do that, Tata, we're going to burn that plow and sacrifice yeah. those options and go all in. When do we start? Start today. We start today.